For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Salams, you're watching the Daily Roundup on People's Dispatch, our selection of some of the top stories from around the world. Let's first take a look at today's headlines. Tube workers in London go on strike. Employment court scuttles health workers' strike in New Zealand. And Brazil's Supreme Electoral Court gears up for October's presidential elections. Thousands of workers of the London Tube joined a strike on Thursday, the 3rd of March, protesting job cuts and other redundancies announced by authorities. Tube workers under the leadership of the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers Union started the protest with a strike on Tuesday, the 1st of March, in which around 10,000 workers participated, according to estimates by the union. The union and striking workers have condemned the decision by TfL, Transport for London, to cut 600 jobs on the London Tube, along with cuts in pensions and wo uh, worsening sorry, working conditions. TfL is responsible for most of the transport network in London, including the underground rail network. According to reports, TfL has made plans to make fresh cuts worth around 200 million, uh, sorry, 400 million pounds, which is about 530 million US dollars, on top of other cuts made earlier. This is likely to be detrimental for job security as well as working conditions, including the workers of the London Tube. According to the union, TfL authorities and the London mayor have refused to give assurances on jobs, pensions and working conditions in the midst of a financial crisis. While battling against all of these cuts and mass layoffs, the RMT union was also subjected to McCarthyite demonization campaign by right-wing media in the United Kingdom. Following their strike on the 1st of March, the Telegraph ran two pieces. First, I quote, the enemy underground, how Putin apologists brought London to a standstill. And secondly, I quote again, how close is the RMT union to Vladimir Putin's Russia, end quote, attempting to demonize the union leaders and their just struggle for workers' rights. To New Zealand now, where in a last-minute decision, the Employment Court sided with the district health boards and passed an injunction against striking allied health workers. The decision passed by the Special Court on Thursday, the 3rd of March, effectively scuttled the nationwide strike that was supposed to be held the following day. It also passed a preemptive injunction for, uh, on a strike scheduled for the 18th of March. The court accepted the argument put forward by the DHBs that the strike of over 10,000 allied health workers offering over 70 crucial services would affect patient, sec patient security as the Omicron-induced COVID-19 surge is straining hospitals in New Zealand. In Feb, uh, the members of the Public Service Association, which has been organizing the workers, had overwhelmingly voted for a 20 two 24-hour strikes that were scheduled for this month. The strike action was called for after more than 15 months of failed contract negotiations with the DHBs. Allied health workers, like I said before, offer vital specialist services in over 70 sectors, including uh, for contact tracing, laboratory and supplies maintenance, and testing, among other things. Uh, they have long complained of low wages, massive workloads, and being treated as secondary to doctors and nurses. Workers are under the terms of contract that expired in 2020 with no wage progression. Our final story is from Brazil, where the Supreme Electoral Court is gearing up for October's presidential elections. The chamber is the highest electoral justice authority in the country and has been the repeated target of President Jair Bolsonaro's attacks on the electoral system itself. He's made several unsubstantiated allegations of fraud in electronic voting and has even threatened to disregard the results of the elections themselves. The electoral court's former president, Luis Roberto Barroso, denounced Bolsonaro for trying to replicate the actions taken by Donald Trump in the 2020 US elections. Barroso himself gained prominence uh, for his decisions against the spread of disinformation and hate speech in Brazil. Now under the lead leadership, now under the leadership of Edson Fashin, the court has guaranteed free and clean elections. Here's a feature by Brazil de Fato on Bo Barroso's tenure and the challenges faced by this court. This year is an electoral one and the ministers ahead of the Supreme Electoral Court must be united to guarantee free and fair elections. Also, they must resist the attacks from President Jair Bolsonaro and his disinformation tactics. 2022 is also a year of change in the ruling of the Supreme Electoral Court. Luis Roberto Barroso left the presidency of the court in February 22nd, and Edson Fachin will hold the position until August. Then, Mr. Alexandre de Moraes will take the seat. The Supreme Electoral Court organizes the elections, decides on issues that affect the electoral process, and in recent years has been trying to be an essential trend to reaffirm the democratic values 
and to protect Brazilian institutions. Sometimes we face things we thought were past. Even so, our role is to keep on pushing in the right direction. During one year and nine months heading the court, Barroso coped with the challenges as the 2020 municipal elections in the middle of a pandemic, judgments made by video calls, and a bill in the Chamber of Deputies proposing the return of the printed ballot. But he gained prominence in decisions against disinformation and online hatred, such as the agreement signed with eight of the main digital platforms operating in the country to take measures against fake news. Barroso has engaged with the issue of mis- and disinformation during his whole presidency of the court. I think his main achievement heading the court was the fight against fake news and the defense of political minorities, as the inclusion of women, black and indigenous peoples. These three ministers see the fight against fake news as a common agenda, so I don't think that the work of Fakim and Barroso will be very different. President Jair Bolsonaro criticizes the court's stance and usually targets Minister Moraes, the rapporteur of investigations on digital militias that focus on the president and his allies. Law professor Felipe Mendonça says that the electoral justice system is historically careful in taking drastic decisions against elected politicians, especially when it involves presidents, taking into account the respect for the votes of millions of people. He believes that Bolsonarism can benefit from this scenario by trying to make the elections even more chaotic and unpredictable. I believe that that is the point we have reached in an electoral year. On one side, Bolsonaro is raising his tone and he will probably raise it until the final vote counting. On the other, the court is treating it as it's okay, we will no longer tolerate Bolsonaro's absurdities. It's a cauldron. Let's see what happens. That's a wrap on today's Daily Roundup. For more on all of these stories, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and do give us a follow on all the regular social media platforms. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.